We are pressing on to maturity from the elementary principles, although I do think the elementary principles are worth reviewing, so head on over to southaustinchurchofchrist.org and listen in to those lessons as well. But we do need to press on, and so we do. Today we are discussing the better covenant, the New Testament. The covenant is our agreement with God and man. A testament is just a synonym for covenant, (laughs) is just a synonym for agreement. And basically in Hebrews 8, At verse 13, it says, In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. We are establishing the New Testament and the completion of the Old Testament. So, we're in Hebrews chapter 8 beginning at the first verse. But basically, our first point is, if he, Jesus, were on earth, he would be no priest. If his priesthood were an earthly priesthood, if his kingdom were an earthly kingdom, he could not serve as a priest. And it's not. It's heavenly. Now, Hebrews 8, 1 through 5, the point of what we're saying is this, and we skip a little bit. We have a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. Every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it's necessary for this priest, the new priest, the the priest in the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, the righteous, also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests already who offer gifts according to the law, the law of Moses, the Levitical priests. What are they doing, though? Well, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. They are serving, and they're serving according to the Bible, what it says in the law of Moses. But in so doing... Faithful though they be, they are serving only a copy and shadow of the heavenly. The tent, the tabernacle, the sacrifices, the priestly service, all of it is symbolic for the spiritual reality, the heavenly reality of priesthood and of offering and sacrifice, forgiveness of sins that's available through the blood of the Lamb. But he explains it even further because sometimes people don't accept this idea their thought is that the law of Moses is permanent and was intended to be permanent a forever law for all generations and that is not the so that is not true and the law itself tells you that that is not true this is where he's coming from when he says this when Moses was about to erect the tent He was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. This is a support for the assertion that they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly. So the first thing, the obvious thing that is meant by this word from God to Moses is that it's a pattern, not the thing. It's the pattern of the thing, not the thing. The pattern here is the image or the likeness, um, which sometimes in other contexts can be translated as an idol, as in the idols of uh, their gods, the star of Remphan that they carried with them as they wandered the desert instead of offering to the Lord God as they were supposed to. Which Stephen points out for us very poignantly in Acts 7, basically saying, well, God gave you a pattern, but you had your own pattern. God had a design, but you had your own designs. Here, they're serving the copy and shadow of the heavenly. Moses was told this thing that you're putting down is a pattern. Make everything in the pattern. 
The other thing that is meant by this that is a little bit more between the lines, but it's certainly there, is the concept that these patterns are pointing to something spiritual, to a truth, and that the law itself is a pattern. The writing about Moses, the Old Testament as we call it, which is more like the prior testament, <laughs> um, is itself a shadow and a copy, an image, a representation, a pattern, a symbol to be interpreted and to be interpreted accurately in the Lord. What he's saying to him, to us now, is that Moses uh, had a pattern. It was very specific and precise, but it was just a pattern. He did not know what was in heaven. He had not seen what was in heaven. He knew that he was writing this down and causing it to be built in this way and that it was following a pattern, which means it refers to something else. But what is that something else? Well, he didn't know. But he always knew that it was but a pattern, not the, the real thing, just a representation of it in human terms. We also are to understand they made things and they did things as God told them to do it and they didn't always understand all the ramifications of that we go back and read this and we can see what God intended by this symbol or by this course of action or by this sequence of events so let's structure the argument here effectively Hebrews is going to show us why it has to be the case that the law of Moses isn't the last thing, the final thing, the complete thing. And this argument stretches from the 8th through the 10th chapters of Hebrews. It basically goes like this. We have Hebrews 8 verses 6 and 7, first of all. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it's enacted on better promises. So Christ's ministry is more excellent than the old one and it's just as much better than the old as the covenant that he's mediating is better than the old because it has been enacted on better promises. And there's more detail later, but effectively we're saying his is better on two counts but specifically because the promises are better. If that first covenant, verse 7 records, if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. If there were no fault, if there were no shortcoming in the first agreement that God made, the Old Testament, the law of Moses, then that would have been complete. Why would you look for another? And somebody will say, well, who's looking for another? You're the one who's looking for another. I'm content with the old one. Yes, that's what Jesus said. Nobody tasting the old wine desires the new, for he says the old is good. <laughs> but no, actually, it's not us who are looking for another. In Hebrews 8, 13, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what's becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Somebody else spoke of a new covenant that necessarily means the obsolescence of the old. This is not our idea. It's not something we came up with or we invented here at the end of the ages. It's what the law has been saying and the prophets have been saying. In the ninth chapter... He lays down this idea that the, the arrangement of the temple, the arrangement of the holiest of holies inside, behind the curtain, inside the inner sanctuary, you know, inside the outer sanctuary, indicates, the Holy Spirit indicates, Hebrews 9, verses 8 and 9, that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. So when you read about the curtain, 
when you read about the sanctuary, when you read the regulations about who is allowed to go there and how are they allowed to go there or how do they become qualified to go there, this is what you're supposed to be taking from it. The Spirit indicates that the way into these holy places is not yet open under that law. And in the ninth chapter, verse 23 and 24, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with such rites, as you read about earlier, but the heavenly things themselves must be purified with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are the copies of the true things, but rather Christ has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. It's not the representation of the holy place on earth, which is inaccessible by anybody except the high priest and only once a year and only with the blood of the sacrificial lamb. No, Jesus is appearing in reality. Christ has entered not the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the real. He is entered into heaven itself, the real thing. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, our high priest, Jesus Christ, not the Levitical one, enters the real temple, the real sanctuary, the real holiest of holies, and is in heaven with God interceding on our behalf. And then the 10th chapter continues, verses 8 and 9. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I've come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. This is a reading from the prophets. And in the prophets, he said, there is no desire or pleasure in the sacrifices, the offerings, the burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are the categories in Leviticus. These are the sacrifices of the law of Moses. After saying this, the next thing he says is, behold, I have come to do your will. But he had no desire for those offerings. This means there's a, there is a will to be done. There is a second. We're not the ones who are looking for a second. The scriptures are looking for a second one. They're pointing to it. They have been saying from the get-go that this was true. If you look at Hebrews 9, uh, 10, verses 19 down to 25... This is the conclusion, really. Therefore, brothers, since we do have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, bodies washed with pure water. And since we have that great priest over God, over the house of God, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And since we have that great high priest over the house of God, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and these we do all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is where it's going. We establish first that the law itself calls itself a pattern 
a shadow, a copy, a symbol. You can see in the elements of that law that there is not access, that there is no permanence about these the forgiveness there because they're offering daily. And every year the priest has to offer again. And the priest is stopped from continuing by death. And another one has to take his place. There's nothing permanent about it. It solves no problem permanently. There is something else coming. And then, of course, the prophets would write and call for something else. That's why we are saying, why look for a second covenant? And as I said, you know, somebody might argue, well, you're the one who's looking for a second covenant. Okay, but not really. I didn't make that up. It came from somewhere. It came from the Bible. (laughs) Who's looking for a second covenant, right? Well, it's in Hebrews 8 as we started, and it's also in Jeremiah. And and that's what we're going to close with. But I wanted to get this before us, that the structure of the argument uh, is such that Christ has better promises. The first covenant couldn't have been faultless because they sought another covenant. Um. The fact that he names another one coming means the first one is eventually going to be finished out. Um, The fact that the copies of the heavenly are sanctified by earthly rites and earthly offerings necessarily means that the real heavenly must be sanctified by better sacrifices than that. And as we said, there's a standard of living, the confidence to enter through the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice he made for us in his body on the cross. We read this earlier, that the curtain is his flesh. It's his body. That's why when he dies on the cross, the curtain in the temple is torn in two from top to bottom, opening the way into the holiest of holies. He was the sacrifice He is the mediator who had flesh as you and I have flesh and suffered as you and I suffer. This is the argument. So why look for a second? Hebrews 8, verse 7 and 8 again. If that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second, for he finds fault with them when we quote from Jeremiah 31. But we go back down to the 13th and remind you, in speaking in Jeremiah 31 of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what's becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And I'm going to, you can read it here in Hebrews if you like, that's fine. I'm going to go ahead over to Jeremiah 31 because I like the idea, if if you will, I like this concept of the, um, the exercise, the practice, if you will, of going to the Old Testament text and finding Jesus there. This is what it means to press on to maturity. When you look in the book of the Acts and how they did this, they taught from the Old Testament. They proclaimed Jesus from the Old Testament. You can see in Acts 8 how The Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah 53 in his chariot. And from this verse, Philip preaches Jesus to him. Which, you know, Isaiah 53 should be an easy one to start with. But you can start with lots of them. Jeremiah 31 is a good one too. That's what we're about to read. But all of these places, that's what they're doing. In Acts chapter 7, when Stephen is preaching, we referred to him earlier, but that entire lesson is not a reminder of their history or a claim that he's a Jew too and legit. That entire lesson is pointing out every symbol of the rejection of God's chosen ruler, Jesus Christ. That's what he's doing. 
and they get it. They understand that that's what he's doing because it enrages them and they kill him. That's because it was so true and so undeniable. The pattern is very clear and very obvious. That's what he was doing in Acts 7. And this is the same kind of thing. We look at the old, but we teach the new. In Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Hmm. Which one was that? Let me think. Hmm. If you think back in your Bible, when did they... (laughs) Right. Okay. Pretty clear what we're talking about here, right? There's coming a time when I will make a new covenant and it will not be like the one that I made before. Which one? The one I made with their fathers the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Well, that's the law of Moses. It's clear. Moses is the one who marched forward, who led them in the wilderness, who gave the law, the tablets that came down from Mount Sinai, That all came through Moses, the law of Moses, very obvious. He said, that covenant, it's going away. Days are coming. I'm going to make a new one, not that one. Jeremiah couldn't be plainer that it's temporary. My covenant, which they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. I was faithful to them, and they should have been faithful to me, but they weren't. That's what he's saying. They didn't keep my agreement. They were unfaithful to their vow. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law inside of them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will each one teach his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. And so again, the kind of law that he makes now will be written inside of us, written on our hearts. And Paul, the apostle, writes about this in one of his letters about that the law is written on not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, on the human heart, that we have the law written in ourselves. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God comes not with observation, but it is within you. True, we have no flag, we have no border, uh, we have no custom or culture, uh, no identifying characteristic, no race or nation. It does not come with observation. It's a spiritual kingdom inside of us. And he said, I will be their God. They will be my people. And we're reminded of 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. uh, These ideas that God said, come out from among them and be separate. And I will be a father to you. I will be God to you. I will be king to you. And he says, no longer will they teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, know the Lord. They'll all know me from the least to the greatest. Because in the law of Moses, you're born Jewish. And as you grow up, they teach you that you need to know the Lord. You know, you're, you're Jewish, but you don't know the Lord because you haven't been taught. You know, that's not going to happen That doesn't happen today in the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God today is a spiritual kingdom that people press their way into by force. The people choose to do this and they make a decision and they go against the grain when they do it. This world doesn't appreciate it, doesn't support it, is not friendly to the idea 
uh, to help us on to God. That's not the way it is. We all choose to serve him and we choose to obey the gospel of Jesus for forgiveness of sins. And in so doing, you know the Lord. Nobody has to teach you to know the Lord. You can't be a citizen of this kingdom, a, a child of God, a Christian without knowing the Lord. It's not possible to obey the gospel unwittingly. And he says, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The law of Moses cannot forgive sins. It's only a temporary respite. And uh, there's more details we'll go through eventually. But for now, suffice that to say, the sacrifice of Jesus is a better and a permanent one, and it really does take away sins. We truly do have forgiveness of our iniquities in the blood of Christ. And we truly do have um, no remembrance of former things with God. All has been made new. You really do have a new start, a new creation, a new beginning in God. Your life starts over when you obey the gospel. You're a child of God, a clean slate, forgiven and free. Oh, the world doesn't necessarily like it, and they may not be nice, but they don't know any different. It's up to you to show them the great blessing that it is to be a child of God and have forgiveness, the rest that is brought to your mind, knowing that you are heaven-bound, knowing that you are doing what God expects. And for that matter, your knowledge from Ecclesiastes, that there are no other guarantees here. Oh, we'll be sad, we'll be disappointed when things don't work out, but we don't rest our hope on those things. We know that they may not work out. If you are not yet a child of God, become a child of God. To obtain for yourself forgiveness. We have this great high priest. We have this great entrance into the holiest of places through him. We have a boldness to draw near to him. And here we have water that you might be baptized in his name for forgiveness of sins, that you might draw near with that conscience sprinkled clean with the blood of Christ, if you will, the body figuratively washed with pure water in baptism. If today you are already a Christian but haven't lived right, listen to the rest of what Hebrews 10 had to say, that we are to continue encouraging one another, building one another up, Pressing on in the faith, knowing that the time is coming, knowing that we have a great high priest in the heavens, knowing that we are dealing with the great God of the universe. And these things are the important things, the real issues of life. Remind yourself, pick yourself up, let's get going again, my brother and sister. If today we can help you with prayer, if we can uh, help you to obey the gospel, please let that need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.